Listen to YouTubers, listen to yourself talk. You use the word literally in literally like every few sentences. It's insane. It's, out, it's actually one of the top trending words on Google right now because literally everybody's using it. I'm literally freezing. I literally just died. I literally had a heart attack. I literally can't even. I'm literally about to preach the best sermon you've ever heard in your entire life. Hey, it's crazy because we're using the word literally to explain things and describe things that are not literally true. In fact, they had to go back and change the definition of literally to include terms that are figurative. Because I'm literally freezing right now. But you're not literally freezing. I literally just died. We were gonna make some like funny videos of like, I literally almost died. A squirrel literally ran out in front of my car and then show like a squirrel half a mile down the street and you slowly touch your brake pedals. But because you want the story to mean something so much more, we wanna throw this word literally into every sentence. My kids are like addicted to the word literally. Um, I don't know if it's YouTube and YouTubers making it so popular but it is a trending word right now. Just listen to people talk and they will use the word literally all the time, especially to talk about things that are not literal. So this entire month, we're gonna be looking at this word literally and we're gonna ask this question. Here's the big idea for the series. Is everything that's written in the Bible supposed to be taken literally? Is everything written in the Bible supposed to be taken literally? And before you yell out an answer, let me give you some examples. Jesus meets with his disciples at a time called the Last Supper. The disciples are there, he pulls out some bread and wine, and he says to his disciples, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Did he literally want them to become vampires? Huh? No, okay. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Literally. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Literally. Jesus said, if someone smacks you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek. Literally? <laughs> I'm literally supposed to get smacked twice? I mean, is he literally meaning these things? Are these literal statements, are we to take them literally? So, I'm gonna lay this out to you. This week is the setup week for the entire series. I have to go in and describe some things. It may not be as exciting and fun this week as it may be in the following weeks, but I'm gonna make this statement. Not every verse in the Bible is taken literally. A lot of the verses in the Bible need to be taken literally. So it's both, okay? It's both. Are we supposed to take the Bible literally? Yes. Are we supposed to take the Bible figuratively? Yes. It's both. And so today, I'm going to endeavor to teach you a little bit of proper Bible study skills and tools. Is that all right? Let me lay this out. And, and again, my staff said it's okay to me to say this. On communion Sundays, we do not hand out buckets of Colonel Sanders' Jesus thighs, and we don't drink O negative blood. Right? Ew, yeah, even you know what's up. You know that's not right, right? That, that's not what we're doing. We hand out wafers and grape juice, and we understand that it is symbolic of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ, okay? We're gonna build into this. We're gonna build into this. 
When Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, he did not say that we were gonna have leaves growing out of our armpits. It was a figurative teaching. And so, in order for us to understand the Bible, Jesus spoke a lot of times in what was called parables, in stories, and a lot of his parables were confusing. We have to understand that Jesus used something called metaphors. Metaphors, okay? Now, I'll be honest, I was not a very good English student. Um, I, I did not understand all of that stuff, so I had to go back and study some of it. Uh, but the New Oxford American Dictionary defines a metaphor as this. A figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is not literally applicable, okay? So a metaphor takes one literal meaning of a word and then creatively leverages it into another meaning to make an impact on the reader. Now you have some fill in the blanks today. We're about to start getting into them. I will tell you straight out that the last two are out of order. They're flipped from how I'm going to say them. So you don't have to get all like hysterical that I skipped one. We will come back to that. Um, I, the only one I have told you so far is the meaning of metaphor, a figure of speech in which the word or phrase is applied, okay? So if I were to tell you this, that my wife is like a ray of sunshine into my life. Literally, you didn't see what I woke up next to this morning. Okay? Post-production. <laughs> post-production. Post. <laughs> oh, God, help me. I got to get out of this. How do I? In, in order to understand the meaning of me saying, my wife is like a ray of sunshine into my life, we must first rely on the literal meaning of the words, ray of sunshine, in order to understand the metaphor, okay? So all metaphors rely first on the literal definition before it can be of any use figuratively in the figure of speech, okay? So we understand that a ray of sunshine brings light, a ray of sunshine brings warmth, a ray of sunshine brings comfort. So because I know the literal meaning of the ray of sunshine, I can then say, my wife is a ray of sunshine into my early morning, right? She brings comfort, she brings light, she brings warmth to me. Relying on the meaning, I understand the metaphor. So to be clear, one must understand the actual meaning of a term before it can understand the metaphor. Psalm 23, one of the most popular Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He lead me like a shepherd leads. Yet, Jesus was a carpenter. He was never actually a shepherd, but we understand the metaphor because we understand the meaning of the word shepherd. A shepherd is a protector. A shepherd is a provider. A shepherd shears a sheep when it's weighed down and it needs its coat taken off. It cares for its sheep. So then we understand, okay, that's what the Lord is to me. He's my protector. He's my comforter. He is my provider. He does these things. I can understand the Lord is my shepherd. Okay? So, is everything in the Bible literal? No. Is everything in the Bible figurative? No. So we have to understand some things that are literal. So let's look at one today, okay? Bear with me. This is not going to be a run around the room hallelujah scripture. This is a literal law that we were to follow in Deuteronomy 21, 18. Ready? If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother and who when they have chastened him, will not heed them. 
Then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elder of his city, to the gate of his city. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you and all Israel shall hear and fear. Literally? Literally? Can you thank Jesus right now that you're still alive? So we got a big problem here. We got a big problem here when it comes to Bible study. This is a literal law. This was in the law of Moses, the time of Deuteronomy. You had to do this or it was shame on your family. So, so, so we got a big problem because this isn't happening today. We're not doing this today. So now we got a bigger question. Just because something is literal doesn't mean that it's lateral. Just because something was literal then doesn't mean that it is lateral for all time. Just because something was written in literal terms in the Old Testament does not mean that it stood the test of the cross and post blood of Jesus come through on the other side of something that we do today. Let's look, at, let's look at another one. Ready? I'm about to step in it. I'm about, to get, I'm about to get in trouble. Ready? Hate mail's coming. Just telling you. <laughs> Old Testament says women should stay silent in church. Oh, well, Joyce Meyer's in trouble. <laughs> Joyce Meyer in big, 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 big trouble, boo. That was literal. It was literal then. It was literal in the times. Is it lateral for all times? Now, some stuff is, some stuff is not. We have to understand or understand proper Bible interpretation. And that's our goal throughout this series, is to look at some scriptures, look at some principles and some things that are both literal, figurative, were for then and stood the test of time today. All right, now, hear me. If you're watching me online, I am not discrediting the integrity of the word of God. Not at all. I believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God, that it is written by the inspiration of God unto man, that is written over a period of 1,600 years by more than 40 authors without one contradiction, one implication of Scripture being out. I believe in 100% Bible prophecy being fulfilled. I believe that we are seeing Bible prophecies fulfilled at this very moment. But I do believe we read it incorrectly. I believe we read it incorrectly and try to hold things that Jesus fulfilled as bondage today. Leviticus tells us that you are forbidden to cut the hair on the sides of your head. So if you've got a fade, you're in trouble, boy. You in trouble with that fade, right? Us baldies, we in trouble. We cut it. We cut those sideburns off. Leviticus literally says, do not cut the hair on the sides of your head. And Leviticus tells us, do not wear clothes woven out of two types of linen. So if you've got cotton polyester blend, you in trouble. <laughs> trouble. Literal versus lateral, literal versus metaphorical. So what are we supposed to do in the literal sense and what are we supposed to do in the figurative sense? So if you go back and watch my Wednesday night Bible study uh, this Wednesday, I talked about the different dispensations of time. Throughout time, God has spoken to man and dealt with man in different ways throughout different dispensations. The first dispensation of time was called innocence. It lasted less than a week. 
It was how God spoke to Adam. He walked with him in the midst of the garden and Adam messed that up. And so then Adam went into what's called the age of consciousness. And I'm not gonna get into it today, but we're working on putting a Bible study together to, to teach that whole, that whole course of the dispensations. Go back and watch it, okay? This is the direction that we're going through in this series. We want to look at how did God deal with man differently throughout time. And the first passage we want to look at is in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 1 through 16. I'm not going to read it. It won't be up on the screen. But it's one of the accounts of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And before we get, we get confused, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John many times tell different sides of the same story. So there are multiple stories of Jesus feeding the 5,000. There is a second instance where Jesus feeds a multitude of 4,000, okay? This is the 5,000. So the first time he feeds 5,000 with five loaves of bread, and then he feeds the 4,000 with seven loaves of bread. I'm not gonna get into what all the definition of that is, but in John, verse, uh, John 1, he talks about, or John 6, verse 1, he's talking about feeding the 5,000, how they multiplied the bread. After that instant, Jesus goes away. He prays. His disciples get in the boat. They go over the river. They forget Jesus. He's still on the other side. So instead of getting his own boat and rowing himself, he is like, I'm going to go walk on the water. If you can walk on water, why not walk on water, right? And so I think Jesus is kind of like sliding across the water, getting to the other side. There's this whole instance where Peter sees him and Peter says, permit this me to come unto thee and walk on the water. The whole walk on the water thing happens. They get to the other side in John 6, 25. When they found Jesus on the other side of the lake, they asked him, when'd you get here? Rabbi, when'd you get here? And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, so when Jesus says, very truly I tell you, what he's saying is, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You're looking for me, not because you just saw me walk on water. You're looking for me, not because of the miracles that I performed. You're looking for me because you want more of that bread. You're wondering where breakfast is at. Is that not what it says? Let's read it, right? You're, you, you're, you're not looking because of the signs of him, but because you ate the loaves of bread yesterday and you had your fill. You want more, you want breakfast. You're like, you're asking, where's the French toast? Come on, Jesus, we're hungry. Jesus is like, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. Wait a second. You made bread like that? Because he just flipped it. He just went from literal bread to now something I'm not understanding. He just went from literally talking about physical bread that I had for dinner yesterday to now some spiritual bread that I don't know what he's talking about. Jesus was not telling them that he could literally make them some Italian bread from Deep Felipe's downtown Middletown that was gonna last forever. Come on. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that etern uh, endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So then they asked him, okay, what do we gotta do to get that kind of bread? What do I got to do to get that kind of breakfast? Jesus said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. What he's basically saying is, oh, you want me to give you another meal, but you don't want me. You want what I can give you, but you don't want me. Oh, no, no, you want this bread that I'm talking about? Because I've now switched it. I'm now talking about spiritual bread. You want spiritual bread? Well, then you got to take me. You got to take me. You got to first believe in me. Then 
you can have this spirit bread. I, mean, I just made that up. Maybe we make a shirt out of that, some spirit bread. Huh? So he asked him, they asked Jesus, okay, so what sign are you gonna give us that we may believe in you? What are you gonna do? Literally? Literally? I just walked on water in front of you! Literally? I literally fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread. That's not enough? Watch what they say. These people are crazy. They're hungry. This is what they say. Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They still want breakfast. They can't get over this. They can't get out of the fact that they're physically hungry. Now Jesus is tight. He's heated. Again, so watch, he says, very truly I tell you. He's like, let me tell you something right now. Let me tell you something right now. You ever get me there? If you ever get me to say that to you, let me tell you something right now. Just know as sweet as I may say it, I'm feeling some sort of way. He says, let me tell you something right now. It ain't Moses who gave your family bread from heaven. Moses didn't do that. Moses didn't do that. I did that. Okay, Moses was the man. Moses was here. Moses was the vessel. But I was the one in heaven dropping breadcrumbs for you. Come on, somebody. This is what it says here. It's not Moses that gave you bread from heaven, but my father who gave you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God, that it came down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, well, then always give us this bread. And Jesus, now he's really, he's like, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. And like, literally? <laughs> literally? Because, I mean, it is a lot of work to take these buckets and go to the well and dip it and get water. <laughs> I'm kind of thirsty right now. They didn't bring my water bottle out today. <laughs> literally? You see... Did Jesus literally mean we were never gonna be hungry again if we believed in him? Well, yes and no. Yes and no. Jesus is speaking in the metaphysical. He's speaking in the multidimensional. And I'm not trying to be weird like some of the shows that are on TV now. He's taking something that they know and they're asking him about in the physical, in the literal. And he's then transitioning over to a spiritual truth. He's bringing it to a spiritual truth. Physically, they understand how good bread is. I mean, that was probably some of the best bread they ever had that night before. It's like some New York pizza kind of bread. Know what I'm saying? Have you ever gone anywhere else in the country but New York and tried pizza? And it is borderline like microwave pizza. But then you come back to New York and there's just something about the dough that you can't make any, it's gotta be the water. It's gotta be the, it's gotta be, I don't know what it is, right? And then we all know you take some bread and you put some sauce on it. And if you're really Italian, you call it gravy. You put some gravy on your bread then you put some cheese on it. Now you got something, right? I'm pointing this, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. But now to say this. We can understand what bread does. Bread nourishes. Bread, when you're hungry and they bring you out the bread that you could dip it in oil, you know, that makes me happy. <laughs> I kind of like, I get a smile on my face when I, when I taste something good. When I taste something that my taste buds haven't had in a while, like I just had some jerk chicken the other day. And when I had that jerk chicken, I haven't had jerk chicken since my honeymoon in Jamaica. When that jerk chicken hit my taste buds, it was like, bow, 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 woo. Like it made me happy. Something happened inside. I haven't had that in a while. I was like, flashback, honeymoon, boo. 
Come on, so I'm about to lose my mind up in here. <laughs> Jesus is now saying, you know that feeling? You know that feeling? I will do that to your spirit, man. Taste a little bit. Taste a little bit of the bread of heaven. Taste a little bit of the sauce from heaven. Taste a little bit of the goodness of God. And when that hits your spirit, boom, bang, bow, woo! Something happens on the inside. I don't know what I just had, but it brings me joy. I don't know what I just experienced, but it brought me peace. I don't know what I just experienced, but I feel something about what just happened to me. This is what Jesus is saying literally, spiritually. Mm. Jesus did not literally mean that we were never going to have to have breakfast, lunch, or dinner again. So in the physical sense, it was not literal. But in the spiritual sense, it was highly literal. And I think that's the component that we miss in Jesus' teachings. Is that he literally wants us to understand that we are first and foremost a spirit being a spirit being that will endure and live forever. We are a spirit who possesses a soul, which is a mind, will, and emotions, and then we live in a body. We are a triune being. We are first a spirit, we have a soul, and we are currently housed in a body. So, literally, Jesus wants to feed our spirits with a bread of life so that our spirits would never hunger again. In this, Jesus is speaking multidimensional. He's speaking metaphysically. Your spirit man, before Christ, before salvation, is looking and yearning for purpose. It's looking for, there's got to be more. Just like when your mom serves you the meal that you hate, so you don't really eat a whole lot of it, and you walk away from the dinner table and you're like, I need some more food because I'm still hungry. Huh? That's what he's saying. If you, if you take what the Spirit has, you'll never have that feeling again. You'll, you'll never feel the lack of your spirit again, that you will be full and you will be nourished. So here's the little truth about that, about this whole passage. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, literally wants to have a relationship with you. Not because you are literally good, but because he is literally perfect. Come on, you gotta believe that today. That there's nothing that you can do good enough to deserve the love of God. He loves you just the way you are. He loves you just the way you are. And the great thing about God is he loves you too much to leave you that way. That he wants to work on you and perfect you and take you higher, step to step, phase to phase. He wants to take the broken, ugly pieces of your life and put them back together again. Literally, he literally wants a relationship with you. He does not want you to go to a church to hear about God. He wants you to personally experience him in your life. Jesus is not literally physical bread, but he is literally the bread of heaven sent to feed your spirit. And today I got to tell you this one. Would you taste and see that the Lord is good? Would you taste and see that the Lord is good? I'm going to close out this message in a different way than we've done lately. Today, if you're in the room or watching online, I want to offer a moment of prayer if you are in need from a touch 
from heaven. Maybe you're in need of a physical healing. Maybe you are in need of emotional encouragement. Maybe you are in need mentally. Maybe you are in need financially. Maybe you are in need relationally. If you are in need of a touch from heaven today, we want to pray with you. We want to take a moment. We had a really, really good prayer time yesterday morning. We set an hour aside to pray for the church, to pray for our county, to pray for our country, and to pray for the election. It was um, apolitical. It was nonpartisan. We were not picking any sides, but praying for people involved and praying for protection, praying for our law enforcement uh, for the next few days and, and what's going to be going on all over our country. And in my spirit, I believe that one of the major spiritual attacks of this pandemic has been to cover the confession of faith, has been to mute faith. It's funny that when the Bible talks about salvation, it says that if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and I think that there could be an attack on our voice, that there could be an attack on our breath. There's a passage that talks about the spirit of Leviathan, the spirit of, of the serpent that would come and try to strangle or silence the voice of faith. And I've been praying, God, what does the church world look like after this? What does our country look like after the pandemic? And I've been trying to like connect with other pastors and talk with them and, and, and look at some, some online people and what they're saying and, 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 and just hear me out, don't tune me off. But in the last few months, it almost seems as if heaven is strangely silent. That there hasn't been a lot of answers. And anytime I find myself in a moment where I feel like I'm praying and I'm not getting an answer, I know that it's not God who's changed. I realized this week I was asking the wrong question. There was no answer to the wrong question. But I began to see answers to the right question. We're all so sick and tired of the pandemic that we're asking God, what's, what's going to happen then when it's all over? So the question that you need to be asking is, what do I want to do now? What do I want to do through you and in you now? We don't need to be worrying about a year from now. <laughs> I hear people saying, I just can't wait for 2020 to be over. As if January 1st, it's magically going to change because it's a new year. Woo, forget it. We forgot it. Come on, somebody. What does God want to do in and through you now? What's the move of God that he wants to do now? What's the spirit of the living God, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead that lives in you and lives in me? What does he want to do in the land now? Oh, we start asking that question, things start changing on the inside. There's an uncomfortableness that begins to rise up on the inside. I'm going to say this to you today. If you need a touch from heaven, whether you're watching online, you could do a little raise hand emoji. But if you're in the room today and you need a touch from heaven, you need prayer of any kind, we are going to do uh, the right thing as far as social distancing. We are going to pray from where we are. But if you need prayer today, would you raise a hand and say, hey, that's me. I need a touch from heaven today. I got both of my hands up. I need a touch from heaven today. I need some, I need some guidance, direction, healing, wisdom, comfort, peace all over the room. Hands all over the room. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. The name that is above every name the name that has no second place, the all-powerful name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow 
And so right now, any sort of sickness or disease that has a name that can be named, we command it to bow its knee to the name of Jesus right now. Cancer must bow its knee to the name of Jesus. Lung disease bow its knee to the name of Jesus. Mental illness must bow its knee to the name of Jesus. We speak to depression and anxieties that they must submit to the word of God. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for rising up on the inside of every believer, empowering them, emboldening them for this season that they are in. I thank you that we are lights in the dark places, that we will not grow weary in well-doing. I thank you, Lord, that your word says that you would return the heart of the son to the father. So, Lord, if there's homes that are broken and, and discords in families where fathers and sons and mothers and daughters have, have been at odds or, or been broken apart, I thank you, Lord, that you will restore relationships in the name of Jesus. I thank you that great is your peace and your undisturbed composure, that God will keep you in perfect peace as your mind is stayed on him. I pray that as you taste and see that the Lord is good, the joy of the Lord would be your strength again, that he would return unto you the joy of your salvation, that there would be a renewed right spirit within you. I pray today the blessings of God over your households. I pray the wisdom of God to run richly through your mind. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for today. If you're in here today or watching online and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we'd love to offer you that opportunity today. Here at Family Church, we make it very simple. We ask you to pray this prayer again. With the mouth, confession is made, but with the heart, we have to believe. So if you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, but you've never taken the time to confess him as your Lord, we'd like to lead you in that prayer today, and it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you hit the little hand raise button or type amen in capital letters in one of the chat rooms? One of our team members would love to reach out to you, get your contact information, and mail you our seven-day devotional called Starting Point. It talks about how to begin your first week in your walk with the Lord. If you're in the room today, would you give me the opportunity, just two seconds to celebrate you? If you prayed that prayer, would you just wave at me real quick? Say, hey, I prayed that for the very first time. Hey, man, I see you. Anybody else real quick over here? Anybody else? Amen. Awesome. We invite you to stop by our Welcome Center in the lobby on the way out. They have that starting point book for you. Father, we thank you today that your word will never return void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for renewing us today getting us on the right track, giving us the laser focused for where we're going now. Lead us by your still waters. Lead us by your peace. As we leave here today, we thank you we're protected and safe. Everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.